Good evening. My name is Jay Rothman and welcome to Real Man Real Talk Raw. It is a special edition. It's Thursday evening, uh, Friday. If you're coming in from overseas, welcome to the show. This evening, we have a what I call a special guest, a rocker. His name is David Reed Watson. And I, uh, I'm excited to have you on the show this evening, uh, usually broadcast on Friday evenings. But tomorrow evening, David has a special event to be at. And so I said, you know, let's let's be spontaneous and let's just do it tonight. And so Thanks. I want to welcome you to the show, David. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I I didn't know that you are uh, you and I have something in common. Uh, maybe we have a few things in common, but one of the things is you're from the East Coast originally, and so yep. maybe that's where we can begin to share some of your background, some of your story, uh, where where it all began for you, and we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hi, everyone. I, my name's David, and I grew up on the East Coast, as Jay said. I, I grew up in a small town, small farm town, and it's called Granby, and it's right outside of Amherst, Massachusetts. It's in the, in the Berkshire area of, of Western Massachusetts. So I grew up with a lot of colleges around my area, and it was, so I was very inquisitive right from the get-go. And, and, um, but following family tradition, I come from a whole family of Marines. So when I graduated high school, I went directly into the Marines and stayed there for, uh, it was, it would, probably would have been a, a whole tour. Uh, you know, uh, um, I ended up doing four years and on my, at the end of my four years, I re-enlisted for five more. And that, this was 1985 when I re-enlisted. Well, that summer, as fate would have it, I ended up going down to Egypt and I got a chance to go in the Great Pyramid of Giza and I remember it very well. I remember it now you have to, I was not like this. I was just, you know, short haired Marine, gung ho. I love the Marine Corps, love my country. And um, something changed when I went in the Great Pyramid. I, I came out of it feeling I, I came out of it, the, my first thing was I, I had more questions that I had never had before. Um, and again, as fate would have it, after Egypt, within a month of my, you know, of, of coming back, I got hit by a car. <laughs> so I got a medical discharge out of the Marine Corps after serving a year of my second enlistment. Mm. And I was very angry back then because I didn't know what I know now. Um, I thought that, you know, the world was turning against me and life stunk and I didn't know what to do. And it went from one bad relationship to another. Um, somewhere along the line in my first marriage, I ended up running across a shaman in, in, um, in Connecticut. Um, and it, it kind of piqued my curiosity as far as the direction I wanted to go. This was kind of a, a, a different, something different in my life. It wasn't just sex, drugs, and rock and roll anymore. It was more of uh, who am I and what am I here for? Um, and after that, and again, I was still stuck in the pattern, but still that those questions started becoming bigger. Um, I think that it didn't really start to impact me until the early 2000s, um, where my second wife at the time and I became life coaches. And we went through a program similar to EST, which is, uh, um, I, I forget his name, Ernest something training. And it, it made me look at myself. It made me um, look at everything that happened around me and take responsibility for it. Um, and I, the biggest impact that I had back then, I remember it to this day, was um, our, our coach, her name was Kathy. Kathy sat us down in a room and she put us up into two groups and she said, I want you to come up with every idea that you can to save the planet. And we're like, okay, we can do this, you know. We all we all went our separate ways, and we ended up coming back with all these great ideas. You know, we're we're coming up with. She's writing them down. She's writing them down. 
the other team is writing them down. Um, they were almost even, you know, one team had 14 great ideas and the other team had 16 great ideas. And the team on the right that had the 16 great ideas, you know, they were hooping and hollering that they won. We won. Look, we, we're going to save the planet. And Kathy was standing there just crying. And we didn't understand why. And she said to us, she goes, she said, you all wanted to come here. You all wanted to change yourselves. So you paid money to come and be in this class to change the world. And you failed. And we're just sitting there going, what do you mean? We failed. She, she said, I didn't, I told you to come up with as many ideas as you can to save the planet. I didn't tell you to go team A, go to one side and team B, go to the other. Why didn't you two decide to come together and come up with a, a bigger list? And that had quite an impact on me of the division that we have in the world and where I stand in that division and who am I? So I've, I've always thought of myself since that moment as someone to bring people together. And um, again, the learning process, I went through that relationship that ended. Um, and so I had gone all the way down to Florida and lived in Florida for about 12 years. And then I, I got transferred out to Boulder, Colorado. And I fell in love with Colorado. I fell in love with, just the beauty of it, the, the air, just the people. Everyone was kind. Well, I was content on staying in Colorado for the rest of my life. I, you know, I, I, I said, I, I did a video that's on YouTube. It's got 20 something thousand views of me doing an Emerson like a Palmer song. Um, it was around Christmas time. It's, it's called Father Christmas. And I, I um, it was my farewell to Colorado saying that I'll be back. Well, <clears throat> as I said, I wasn't going to leave at all, but my sister Darlene had a disease called Sjogren's. It's S J O G R E N. And it's an autoimmune disease that dries up your body. I was doing an album in New York at the time. And this was around 2000, 2008, 2009, that in that area. And I went out to visit her. And she was in, in, a, in a hospital in Connecticut. And she was really frail. And her skin, you know, like almost reptilian in a way, you know. Mm. And, you know, she, she just said, Dave, I'm not going to make it. And I blew it off, you know. I was like, yeah, whatever. You're, you'll be fine. Don't. You're, you're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. And she said, she goes, when I pass, promise me that you will pursue your dreams, that you'll pursue the music. She goes, God gave you a voice. Why aren't you using it to, to your fullest extent, your fullest ability? And I, I was like, yeah, whatever. You know what I mean? She's not going to die. Well, she ended up passing away. And she passed away in 2010 and I packed my bags and I moved to LA. I joined a band called the constant out there. Um, and just since that day, I've been pursuing music and I haven't really so, looked back. Do you credit your sister with that? Do you think that she, that she gave you that motivation that she kind of, she gave me that kick in the ass that I needed. What do you think up until that point was holding you back? Fear. Why did, why did you need, what's that? Fear. Fear, what were you fearful of? Fear of failure, mm. you know? And so let me ask you this, you know, cause you've been in this, you've been in this gig for a while now, uh, at least, well, a long while, way longer than 2010. Cause we're gonna go back. I wanna go back to your early years about, uh, but before I go there, I know you've, you've had to walk through fear since 2010, and I'm sure you have faced all kinds of what you refer to as failure. I like to refer to it as opportunities, you know, uh, lessons, because right. through each time we get hurt, each time we fall, 
we get bruised, sometimes the bruises are pretty significant. Yes. But when we are able to look in a mirror and really assess uh, the damage, but we look at the lesson behind it, right. we grow. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There were, there were many times in my life where I played the victim and I don't play the victim anymore. Everything. How do you shift? How did you find the ability to shift from being the woe is me? You know, life sucks. Uh, I'm never going to get it. Whatever, whatever that story is that you keep kept repeating in your head. How did you, how were you able to shift from being that victim to, to no longer being a victim? And if you're not the victim, then, then, who, then who are you? Well, we all know victims in our life, and we all know how we shy away from victims because we don't want to hear their stories, especially, um, I mean, we can be compassionate, you know, being in the capacity that we are in now. Um, but when I was in victim mode, um, I noticed that the people around me, we're all victims as well. You know, like, like attracts like. Yes. You start noticing their patterns. You start noticing how their life is just going down. I, I, you know, I, I attribute a lot of it to Esther Hicks and Jerry Hicks. And I, we, you know, both of us going to Agape, I volunteered as an usher when, when uh, Esther Hicks came to town. And they had a big impact on me. You know, the... I mean, uh, Barbara Byrne, uh, is it Barbara Byrne, I think, did the, who did The Secret, was just like a, an introduction to the law of attraction. And I, I studied the law of attraction for quite a bit, and mm -hmm. it, which is really easy to do. I mean, it, it makes, com you know, I'm, I'm very much into common sense. And common sense says that whatever you focus on becomes your reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so your words too, you know, we got to be very careful the words we speak. Yes. Whether yeah. we speak them or we speak them, we don't even have to speak them. If we think them, it's going to happen too. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. And that, um, I wrote a song with that, with that band DNA I was telling you about earlier. It's called Monkey Mind. And no, this is my monkey. This is Eyeballs. <laughs> eyeballs? Yeah. He's our, yeah. he's our pug. Uh -huh. Um, but monkey mind, you know the concept of monkey mind that we, it's it's that scattered stuff that we're making up in our head all the time. Yeah, about 60,000 thoughts go through our mind in a 24 hour period. Yeah. That's how many the average person races through. So there's a lot of monkey mind going on. Right, so how do you organize that into rational, compassionate thought? and? The only way that I could figure out how to do that was to give of myself. That was, it was easy as that. And once I start giving more of myself to people, the less the monkey mind was going off. And the more mm -hmm. I, you know, the more I, I played, the, the less, the less that I played victim. How do you, how did you, uh, how did you find, what were some of the ways that you were able to give back to others? Uh, anything come to mind? What, how did you, how were you able to start to serve other people? Well, it starts small. You know, uh, when I lived in Florida, uh, I remember Wayne Dyer speaking about um, giving to the homeless. You know, a lot of people won't give to the homeless. They say, ah, oh, that guy's an alcoholic. I'm not going to give it to him. You don't give on your judgment. You give because you can. And when you give what you can, when you can, it's telling you that you have abundance. So that's that's about when it started. And it started catapulting. And as 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 my life became, you know, how people say you're lucky, it was all because I just kept on doing this. Um, it could be anything. It could be just giving this interview here. This could be, it could be um, giving a kid a, a, a wave or, you know, anything. It's just, and sometimes it's as simple as smiling and acknowledging people. I, I do that. I learned pretty early on when I was going through my healing process, as I was writing my, 
my beach cruiser along the, the bike path in Huntington Beach in Newport Beach, California. Beautiful. I started to smile at people and acknowledge them, strangers, right. hundreds of people every single morning. And while I was doing that, of course, I had my music on in the background that uh, the, most, the majority of people seem to enjoy. And just by smiling and acknowledging people, it was just a beautiful experience that I gave it away and I got something back in return, like what you call the abundance. Yeah. There's different levels of abundance and they're not all financial. You know, we tend to, we tend to go right to the abundance of, we think it's financial abundance and it's not always, it's, it's, there's so much more to abundance than just the green dollar. Yes. And uh, I think that's the abundance that you're referring to. It's not just the money. Yeah. Yeah. We got, I've, I've struggled with money most of my life, but because of who I am and the way I am, all of my needs are always met. It's crazy. It's, I mean, it's, it works. I don't, yes, I go through times that I'm, I mean, I'm human. I definitely go through times where I'm freaking out, but, um, nine times out of 10, it, it, something gets handed to me. Yeah. And it's usually about 1159 PM. It's like one minute to midnight. You know, that's what I've experienced over the last two years. I've had some really dark moments from a financial standpoint. Never, ever thought that I would land there. But, you know, it, what it does is it, it teaches, uh, it's taught me a lot about humility and, uh, and just have faith and trust that somehow, some way, when I show up for others, um, it'll just work out. It'll just, things will happen. Yeah. It, it should it's be scary. It's scary to do at first, you know. It's still scary to do, to, you know, to, to show up for others when you're feeling like you can't even show up for yourself. But it's just going, you know, who was it that said it? Somebody I know that um, it would be like, oh, what the fuck, do it anyway. That was the, you know, and it's that little little hump that you get over to, to do it. Yeah, you have to push through. You have to push through. Yeah. Which is hard to do sometimes. But, yeah. you know, surrounding yourself with like-minded people helps you to do that. You know? It does. Yeah. It does. I want to just take a moment here just to welcome some people that are on live with us this evening. My mom from uh, Boynton Beach, Florida. Hi, Mom. Um, here. Angie Taylor, welcome. Sherry Bliss, welcome. Shannon Cobb, so nice to see you, Shannon. I hope you're still watching the show. Uh, Deb, Deborah from Payson, Arizona. She got a couple of, uh, we want to talk about giving it away. This woman is absolutely beautiful. Uh, she's been a member of my community for some time now, and she ordered some shirts. I, uh, Mary and I started an online apparel company called Choose Apparel, and it's basically positive affirmations that, uh, that you could that you choose to you know invest in for yourself. It's a reminder tonight. It's choose serenity. Today I wore uh, choose compassion. You mentioned compassion, and and so she bought. She invested three shirts for herself, and a friend came over yesterday that she just felt her energy was really down, and uh, she just unpacked. She just received the package, and she had it for less than an hour, and she said to her friend, she said, "Tell me what you're feeling right now. Like what?" I, I'm going to paraphrase it, but something in fact, like if, if there's any thought that comes to mind, an emotion, something about the future, what is it that you're feeling? And she said, I feel hope. And one of the shirts that she had bought for herself was called Shoot Hope. And she gifted her shirt, brand new shirt, she had never worn it, just literally took it out of the wrapper and said, I want you to have this shirt. And there, there you talk about, you know, Deborah giving it away. And uh, what an absolute beautiful, beautiful exchange of, of love and kindness from one person to another. Leanna Rodriguez, thank you so much for being here live tonight. She and I worked together seven and a half years plus. Uh, she was a project manager at one of the companies that I was a senior manager at. And so thanks for being here live tonight. Amanda Wallfield, thanks for being on. Karen Boda, Nina, thank you for joining us. If you don't make it live, you know, we have the replay and I posted the show. I tagged you in it. So your people in your community can uh, 
or if they want to watch now, they, they can or they can catch it later. Uh, but I love where our conversation is going. And you know what really impressed me, besides the fact that you're an East Coaster like I am, and I don't know if you're a Boston Red Sox fan or not, you've lived in L.A. and you've lived in Boston, you grew up in Boston area. You mentioned a Berkshire is one of my best clients. I was 21 years old, and uh, I was doing business in a Berkshire's. At the time, I had two clients. Was, one name was, uh, the guy's name was Steve Sheck. And the other guy is Dick George, and they both own Burger Kings in the Berkshire. So I was up uh, probably uh, in Pittsfield, in uh, Pittsfield, Mass. Yep, Pittsfield. I was born in North Adams. So that, I, did, uh, uh, I did a Burger King in North Adams. I did that Burger King there in your in your town. I know you're a little younger than I am, but uh, this is uh, in the early mid mid to early 80s, like 84 through 87. Okay. I, was, uh, I was doing the Burger Kings in, in the Berkshires and uh, and all of uh, New England states. and But we're not here to talk about that. Well, uh, we actually share something else there. I did all the advertising for Burger King. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. Yep. What I wanted to touch on, so we have that in common. We also have, a, we both were our members of Agape Spiritual Center. Yes, uh, where we both got uh, we both got some of our grounding on our spirituality and learned a lot from that. I, I, from what you shared with me earlier tonight, you actually were in a choir, the uh, yep. Agape Choir. Is that right? Yep. yep. Under uh, Rick, Ricky, Under Ricky, Ricky. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> one of the uh, things I wanted to share with the community tonight was how you got started in music. Was you did musical theater. I believe you may have started in, was it grade school or was that not into middle or high school? It was great. My, my dad was, a, a, my dad had a band called the Tiki's back in the late fifties and they put records out and he was, it was folk music. So wow. my dad played banjo and sang and, uh, but there's music on both sides of the family. Everyone sang, everyone sang in church. That was number one thing. Um, so, but anyway, the, um, I want to get back to the part where I was very stunted in music for a long time. I didn't, I didn't actively pursue it. You know, my I told you my sister gave me that that punch in the gut that I needed to actually get off my duff and, and go take care of business. I think a lot of it was because my, you know, I used to sing in church and I've got a very loud voice. And my mom would say, Shh, David, don't sing so loud. And I think psychologically, when you're a young kid, it kind of, I took it as, don't sing. You were too loud. What you heard is you're too loud. Children yeah. need to quiet down. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's a very New England kind of, kind of concept. But uh, you know what? All that stuff I made up about that, now is is gone thank you know uh, my mom actually came out and saw my band when we played in boston the last time around and um she loved it she loved that i was doing what i i love to do and that i'm good with people i'm great with crowds and it, it felt good it felt really good and that it, it made me um made me look back and at how other people stunt themselves and why they stunt themselves what what is it that gets them to stop and i know it's all made up stuff you know like the acronym for fear right it's false evidence appearing real yes sir that and forgetting everything's all right that's right you know and it's all made up all every it's all lies know. they're all lies yeah. yeah our power can be huge if we just allow it to you know, if we get rid of that fear that we've made up ourselves, you know, or somebody instilled in us and may and, you know, got us to believe. That's called the broken record. You know, at some point we got to smash it. Yeah. Yeah. So I smashed it. And it's it's scary. It's scary to smash that record. It's scary to um, to live in and live in a live on the edge and if you will um when when we when we stay in our little bubble of fear 
we become accustomed to all that. You know, we, and it becomes comfortable. That's the norm. That is the norm. When you break out of your comfort zone, it's scary. And anytime I start to fall into a comfort zone, I break it because I know that it, it'll, it, it's going to take me to the next level. So I'm going to jump in right there because this, for an example, I can so relate to that. I was in such a comfort zone for 36 months living in Huntington Beach because right. that's where the majority of my healing took place for my mind, body, and soul. Right. And I woke up one day this summer and I had that next awakening, that moment of clarity when I realized that I had, I had put myself in such a place of comfort that it no longer felt comfortable. I felt like I plateaued. I felt like I peaked and plateaued at the same time. And I knew that I needed for me to up level or, or mm -hmm. get to the next level of, of healing my mind, body and soul. Right. I needed to push out of my comfort zone. And what better place to do that than the mountains of Arizona? And so once I had that moment of clarity, mm -hmm. and once I understood that, uh, that something had shifted in my medical diagnosis, within three weeks, our boxes were packed and we shut down our place in Huntington Beach. That was just where all the miracles unfolded. Right. And I pushed myself into discomfort. I literally drove a U-Haul into discomfort because I had no idea right. how I would like it here, how I would respond, would I be able to, now, how would I do my spiritual practice that I did every morning at the beach, like with prayer and meditation and connecting with God and, and uh, how will I deal with the people and the heat and the environment and, and just the whole setting, leaving what was comfort, leaving what I knew was working. And nobody in my life, there was, I don't believe one person that was in my life understood me, like mm -hmm. understood the decision that I had made. But the beautiful thing about that is this, and I know you've experienced this, David, is that once you reach the point where you are in touch with yourself and you have that connection with your, with your you know, you have that connection with your, your inner soul, your inner self, um, and you trust your intuition and you understand what intuition and wisdom from within means, it doesn't matter what other people think. You're going to make the decisions that you believe are in your best interest, even when most people don't un agree or don't understand the decisions that you make because there's nobody that knows what's best for David Reed Watson than you. I, um, the universe has a way of, of, of letting me know too. I've been hit by cars many times and each time it's changed my life. Hmm. It's, um, I take it as a, as a universal slap because I won't listen because I'm stubborn. So the universe kind of nudges me and it's not so gentle way. What do you think's behind getting hit by multiple cars? What, what lesson have you not learned that you, that have you figured out what you needed to learn so you don't get hit again? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm on that path now. Does it have something to do with uh, crossing at the crosswalk and stop jaywalking? Only I can do that with my name. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, my thing is just getting hit by cars. Those are my wake up calls. Wow. So I, I refuse to get hit by cars again. I have decided that I'm going to listen from now on. And I'm going to, you know, and, and you said a very important thing about getting out of your comfort zone. You know, you went from Huntington Beach to where you are now, which is a very peaceful, and beautiful area, but still out of your comfort zone. I moved from Marina Del Rey and my Agape family mm. to Las Vegas. Las Vegas is difficult. I live there, so I'm, I, I'm, I live there too, so I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, I, I consider Las Vegas bipolar. You know, there's some of the greatest people you meet and some of the worst people you ever meet. Yeah. And it's very difficult here. Um, but I have started to get into communities. You know, I, I, I did an ayahuasca journey not too long ago. Where did you do that? Did you do that locally or did you do that like in Costa Rica or one of the islands or? It's um, in this area. I can't, I can't tell you what state. Okay, no, no worries. 
yeah, they're, they're kind of private about all that. They're beautiful. And how was that experience for you? It was amazing. It was amazing. Um, I know I want to do it again. I, I, I learned some things. Um, I think the main thing I learned out of that was because I had had, they, they, they talk about talking to grandmother ayahuasca. So I talked to grandmother and I asked her if this musical pursuit that I'm on is really, is it, I mean, is this really my calling or is this just something I want to do and I'm making this up? Uh, because it's, it's a struggle, you know, you go on tour and you lose money. That's basically how it, how it is. You're not, you're not making a lot of money in this business. And not that money is the end all be all, but you know, it, it, it's, it's nice to have that income so you don't have that stress. That, that's all. Um, and so I asked her, I, I said, am I on the right path? And, and she gave me an affirmative yes. And then gave me examples all around around me of it. So it was a, it was a very beautiful experience. Mm. So um, it's something I want to do again. My next, I want to do mushrooms. <laughs> you know, I don't know about the. I did those in college, and uh, it took a long time for me to get over that one and and begin to accept eating regular mushrooms. And yeah. I still have somewhat of an aversion to mushrooms because of that. I did a few few of my days in college as as as, uh, as the guy that I listen to in, who lives in in the marina lives in Venice Beach is uh, Ralph Smart and, and he says dive deep into the infinite waters and that's what I want to do all the time I'm gonna dive deep I want to go down where it hurts and get rid of that pain and get rid of all that old stuff. Well, here's the question, because I, I I love to hear that, and I acknowledge you, and I admire you for saying that. It, you don't hear too many men that that, will, that are willing to be that vulnerable and put that out there like you just did, and I thank you for that. And And that's really what I've been on. That's the journey I've been on for the past three years. But here's my question. Do we need drugs to do that? Do we need mushrooms to do that? Do we, you know, like, what it, I, it takes you to a, it takes, it makes it perhaps easier to get there. Yeah. But is it, is it necessary? And how much work have you done on your own without, the, without the ayahuasca or, or, or whatever tools you've reached for? I've done a lot of work, a lot of work. I've studied meditation. Um, Yes, they are a fast track. They're, they're a quick way to jump you to the next level. That's the way I look at it. I don't look at them as drugs. I, I look at them as medicine. Yeah. You know. Did you read the book, uh, Shit the Moon Set? Have you picked that book yet? No, I haven't. I haven't. Okay. But they're, it's, it's, these are medicines, you know. It's yeah. not like going and smoking pot and getting high. These are, these are medicines that actually work. And if I can't reach that plateau through meditation, which could take many, many, many years, I can use these tools to take me up, up a little bit higher. And, and they've worked. I, I know that, I know at where I'm at now, they work. Yeah, I actually I'm willing to peel the onion layers apart and go into it full force. Yeah. I got for a copy of that. I've got a copy of that book, and I'm going to send it to you. Um, send me your, your your address in Vegas. Okay. It's an, it's an easy read book. This guy, I I believe he actually lived in Marina del Rey, and uh, <laughs> and he was uh, suffered with bad alcohol and drug addictions. Right. And he now owns uh, a retreat, and I believe it's in Costa Rica. And uh, and his book is his story, his story of living or le- becoming a survivor, and living his life today. And uh, part of his part of his retreat is uh, ayahuasca. And I read the book. And uh, when the finances allow, when it's the right time, I I believe I'm probably going to make a trip there uh, 
to his facility. I know we don't have to go there. There's, like you said, there's many places to have that experience. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but they're all over the country. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, I, you know, because I myself, I would love to go down there. I want to go, you know, sit in that void of Machu Picchu and, and discover that as well. Matter like, of fact, hold on one second. It just hit me. You know where I, I got like copies of that book it was at Agape. I was there one one weekend, and uh, they had like two books on each chair. Jerry was a member or is a member of Agape. Oh, okay. And okay. Uh, and and actually Beckwith, Michael Beckwith and him are partners in his re. I believe it's at his retreat. Uh, Michael does a retreat there every year. I can't recall the name of it. I and love Michael. Yeah, he's just the he's the best speaker I've ever witnessed in my entire life. I've never met anyone that that can speak the way he speaks and uh, pray the way he prays. Have you? Uh, you probably heard this or not, but it's something I listen to regularly. Is he's got an album out called Abundance, and it's amazing. Hmm. They're all his sermons put to music. Wow! No, I have not listened to that. And make sure you get a copy of that. Okay. It is amazing. One of his songs, and you know, you know the Rev. It's like you, you are the answer. He's, you know, it's he's special. You know, you were in the Agape Choir. There is, I was there one weekend, not that in the past year maybe, mm-hmm. and Jason Powell did a duet with. Uh, who the heck was it? Uh, it's on YouTube. It is the most. It's the. They did their version of the prayer. Okay. Um, do you know? Have you? Do you know who Jason Powell is? Um, I, don't, I don't. Marianne Lewis. You know Marianne Lewis. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Marianne Lewis and Jason Powell performed the prayer together. They made. Uh, J. Uh, uh, I. The two guys that there's been a guy, a few guys that have done a rendition of that, their version of it. Uh, Josh Grobin has done it, and Andrea Bocelli has done it with uh, Celine Dion. Uh-huh. Um, but this version of uh, Marianne Lewis and Jason Powell done at Agape was just amazing. You would, I love, love, it. would love it. I'll send you a copy of it. Okay. Um, but well, anyway, get back to your story. Yeah, we're, we're kind of moving all over the place, but that's okay. This is an organic show. Yeah. <laughs> I really wanted to uh, have you sing a song and, and uh, a spontaneous song for us, but I know that you're nursing back uh, some vocal cord, uh, some kind of illness that, uh, that you're yeah. dealing with right now. But, it was, uh, uh, we but did. We did Kiss Night Saturday night. It's all night long playing Kiss. It's for a benefit here in Las Vegas. Um, Took you. Yeah, I only sang a couple songs, but I was there pretty much 24 hours. So it was uh, the smoke and the talking, yeah. and it just killed me. And I, I collapsed yesterday. And, Tell me a little bit about, I want to go back and revisit a little bit when you were talking about that you want to go really deep. Like, what is what is that about for you? And what is that, how deep do you think you've you've gone? And uh, and what does that mean to you to go deep? And how do you get there today? Well, getting there today for me is is taking these journeys. I mean, doing, a, doing an ayahuasca journey is not for everybody. Um, and they are scary because you don't know what to expect. I mean, most people are afraid of the hurt engine, you know, throwing up. Um, or they don't want to deal with their demons. And I'm just like, bring it on. Because I, I treat it the same way I treat music, okay? I wasted so many years of my life not actively pursuing my music where I didn't start really pursuing it until I was in my 40s, okay? So the last 18 years or so, 15, 15 years, I've actively been pursuing my music and I I don't want to waste any more time. So I want to fast track, I want to catch up. 
with all the time that I lost. Um, same thing goes with my spirituality. I want to fast track and catch up and go deeper and know more. More not knowledge wise, you know, I don't have to know everybody's name and every, you know, modality or anything like that, but knowing up here, knowing in my subconscious, you know, being being that light. I want I want to be no different than Beckwith. You know? I want to inspire just like those people that have inspired me. I feel like that's my duty. How much of that do you think you're able to do today through your music? I, I presume you write your own lyrics? Yeah, I do. Um, and how does music help? How does it help you? Music helps me because it's um, it's like a written diary. Um, and if I can if I can write something down in that diary and share it with somebody, and they can it can help them. I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, I think about four years ago, there there's a there's something out in Anaheim. It's called NAMM, N A M M, and it's uh, it's a music convention. Yeah, my son goes to it. He, okay. Uh, yeah, he's a musician. Yeah. I had a girl. I was I was standing there with Taylor, my fiance, and, and this girl comes running up to me. She goes, you, 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 David, 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 David Reed Watson, David Reed Watson, David Reed Watson. I was like, hi. I, you know, I didn't know who she was. And she said to me, she goes, your song with the beating of your heart changed my life. And I didn't know what to say. I was dumbfounded. I was so taken back. I, I didn't know. How do you, how do you acknowledge that? You know, and that was the first time. And then, you know, when it how did it, how did it feel how does it feel right now to even share that story? Does it bring you back to that moment? Yeah. Because it felt awkward. It, 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 yeah, I remember the old demons coming up and saying, Who are you to think that you can change someone's life? And they must be delusional. Who who is this crazy person, you know? Well, how is it today to repeat it though? Are you able to receive it from that space of humility and just understand that that you can be a, a yes. change maker for other people? Yeah, it's um, you know, I, I like to say uh, like the old commercial, right? Uh, let go of my ego. <laughs> I think I think once I drop the ego, I got a song where I I sing it. I say. Drop the ego, drop the anger. Um, when we when we can drop the ego, we can acknowledge stuff like that because we know it's not about us. It's about what's coming through us. Um, so now, looking at that now is much different than before. You know, then it was I was embarrassed. I I, I didn't know how to thank the person. It was creepy. You know, but that was all ego. That was the ego saying, "You're nobody." You, you know, you, how you know? How dare you even start to think something good about yourself? Where now that ego is, you know, it's always there. The ego's always there. It's just us. He's doing push-ups in a closet, just waiting for that moment to come out and just kick your butt. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? I do push-ups too. Amen. Yes. I balance, I balance it out. It's called spiritual push-ups, right? Right. You know, the opposite of ego and uh, of ego and pride is humility. And ego stands for, you may have heard this, I don't know, because you said something else that uh, kind of leads me to believe you may have heard this. Ego stands for edging God out. Edging yeah. God out. Yeah. You know, when we're in our own heads and we, we inflate, we think we're that great. Uh, there's no God in that. That's just our our exterior, our our exterior self, not our in inward self, not our not who we really are at our core. At our core, we all are loving children, and uh, 
and we just look, yeah. up. I look a lot now at ego um, as fear. Usually, the more inflated the ego, the more fearful the person is. They're afraid of something. They, yes. they don't, you know, I, um, we see it in politics right now. We see it in our government. And we see it with, you know, in the news. It's all fear-based, you know, that pumping up your chest is all fear-based. I'll, I'll, now, the, you know, I'm, I'm not the Marine anymore. Um, and because I've dropped the ego and dropped the anger, I can easily walk away from somebody and let them feel like they conquered me if they want to, if that's what serves them at that time. I, I have nothing invested in that. You know? Beautiful. Of all the songs that you have written, uh, being that we're, you're going to rest your voice and you're not going to sing live for us. Yeah, sorry. Would, would you be able to uh, share maybe a section or a portion of a song, a verse, um, a, a song that has some significant meaning in your life today? Yep. Yeah. Um, I had mentioned DNA. Um, DNA stands for David, Neil, and Alex. Uh, my friend Alex Santos, who lives out in Portugal, and my friend Neil Fraser, who lives in England. We all did an album together. Um, this a band called Rage of Angels in England. And we all started collaborating together and we ended up putting together DNA and those guys write this beautiful music that it has such emotion in it already that the words just come flowing out of me. And there's a song that I wrote called The Flow and it's all about once we drop that ego, once we allow ourselves to be open that we tend to just flow through life almost effortlessly where that's when people say that you're you're lucky you know and you laugh inside and as as uh, reverend michael would say that luck is living under cosmic knowledge that's so that's what this song is about so you want me to play it i'd love it love to hear it all right. And, uh... Robert Taylor, thanks for coming on. Thank you. 
I meant to fade it out. I cut it off. It's okay. It, it all works, you know. Um, we we are got about nine minutes left. Uh, yeah. We've we've used our hour up, yeah. almost over. But I do want a uh, couple of things that come to mind. One is, if people want to listen to mu your music, buy your music, what is the best way for them to reach out and find you? Very easy. I've got a website, davidreedwatson.com, and I've got a music player along the side. And they have uh, uh, Amazon links and iTunes links, or or they can just listen to the players on the side if they want to. Um, I was introduced to you by uh, Debbie Garcia, founder of Spirituality Gone Wild, and she's a big music lady. And uh, I've caught a lot, a number of her shows where she opens with one of your songs. That's like a video. And uh, you know, I I actually fell in love with your music. Um, yeah. And I enjoy listening to it today. And so I want to acknowledge you and thank you for, and thank Deb for introducing me to you. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to invite you to maybe spend just a few minutes that we have left to share with our community tonight that's here live or that catches us on the replay, uh, maybe some closing words of wisdom, some closing thoughts that, um, that you have come to learn about yourself and how it's helped you through this journey of your life and coming home to yourself. Well, the biggest one is to let go of your ego, for sure. Um, I mean, you said it, humility. Humility's hard, but when you accept it and you just accept that you're here to give to other people, you realize, you know, when you when you feel that welling up in your throat, that's the most fantastic feeling you could ever feel. Yes, yes, isn't it? Yeah. I feel that almost every day. That's why I go live a lot. When I get inspired, when I'm hiking, when I'm almost three thousand feet above sea level, and I'm surrounded by these incredible vortex, these mountain ranges. I get inspired. It's just, it just, I just feel like I got to get it out, and I let it out, and I just share what I'm feeling yeah. in the moment. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's dark, and sometimes it's light. It don't matter, but just feeling it and letting it out. And I get emotional sometimes. I get teary-eyed, and uh, I love those feelings. You know, I'll take those feelings over pain any day of the week because I know what that feels like too. Yep. Give, give, give. And when you don't feel like you have anything to give, give more. Mm. So, you would you say that that is uh, one of the in ingredients to healing your own mind, body, and soul? Definitely. Yeah. yeah it's very selfish. <laughs> very selfish. By giving, you're getting back tenfold. Mm-hmm. So be selfish. Give to everyone. Let allow other people to feel that. Don't hoard it. It's not fair. You know the people that are hurting in your life. Send them love. Give them love. Let them feel that feeling, and then eventually they will want to just feel that welling up as well. I love that. It's simple. Yeah. How long did it take you to figure that out? To have that that awakening? Dude, I'm 55. I still haven't gotten. It. How old are you? 55. Damn, you look good for your age, dude. I'm 57. I thought you were like 40. Couldn't say you were 45. When you said 55, I thought maybe I heard you wrong. No, no, I'm 55. I'm 55. Uh, I and so when I, do you think you had your spiritual awakening when you realized that it was time for you to get out of your own ego and start to give it away? My late 30s. Wow. It took wow. a long time. It took a long time because I was very caught up in how I looked. You know? I was very caught. And I don't mean physically. It's It was more like how I showed up. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And when you have nothing invested in how you show up, your authentic self comes out. Mm. 
Mm. Who cares? We're all going to die. Might as well, you know, feel that feeling every day if you can. Why go through life angry and pissed off? Why? So what you have just done is, I call it the liquid gold. You know, it's a tool. You just shared a, a, a wealth of knowledge. I call it liquid gold. Some people refer to them as golden nuggets. Uh, you live in Vegas, you could call it a golden nugget if you want, but for me, it's liquid gold. You know, it's pure, authentic healing, a healing tool that you just gave away, you know, which is just give it away, you know, show up for other people. When we come from that space of pure, authentic love and kindness, Jay Shetty, who's one of my mentors and coaches today, says it very well. He says he doesn't make any decision in life. He doesn't do anything, whether it be business or at home or in his circle of life. If it doesn't come from love, he says no, no matter how much money is behind it. If there's not love behind it and it's ego, pride, and greed, he says no thank you. And his life has changed once he understood the power of love. That when we can come from that space of kindness and love, as Karen Palmer speaks about so eloquently on her show for Spirituality Gone Wild, our life changes, you know, and it sounds like, uh, you know, you're a, you're a blessed man today. We we have all we need, even when we think we don't. Yep. And That's got balls. Eyeballs, I tell you. Eyeballs we found on our doorstep. And he, no was two pound, he was two pounds, but he came to us because he knew that we'd take care of him. Beautiful. You know? Well, welcome to the show. Eyeballs had no idea that Eyeballs was going to be seen tonight yeah. uh, by his, master, his or her master. But uh, I do want to say this. We're going to, we're going to jump off in a, in a sec here. At 7 o'clock, there's a new show premiering on Spirituality Gone Wild. It's with Josie and uh, wow, recovery, recovery James or something to that effect. And she's going to have a guest on tonight at 7 o'clock. It's a brand new show on Spirituality Gone Wild. And Sunday at 3 o'clock, my uh, I've got my second show uh, called Real People, Real Stories, Raw, co-hosted with Debs, Deb. And uh, we've got a, a guest coming on, Rita. And she's going to be sharing her story of her healing process from her sexual assault and uh, what her life has been like since she, uh, since she had that event uh, happen to her. Uh, so that's Sunday at 3 p.m. West Coast time, 7 p.m. tonight with Josie and her guests coming on real shortly. With that, David, I want to thank you for coming on live tonight, Real Men, Real Talk Raw. And uh, I'd love to have you come back on maybe when your voice is back. And when you could uh, you could sing you could sing live for us and we can continue our conversation. Yeah, I got my guitar right there. I just beautiful. I look forward to it. <laughs> All right. Have a beautiful evening and uh, get some rest. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Peace.